Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, what we do during this time here at Grace Gospel, in case you're kind of wondering, uh, what I do is my style of preaching is called expository preaching. So let me give you a good definition. This is from, actually it's from online, uh, from this site called Got Questions, and then you give biblical answers. It's actually pretty good. It says, expository preaching involves the exposition or comprehensive explanation of the scripture. That is, expository preaching presents the meaning and intent of a biblical text, providing commentary and examples to make the passage clear and understandable. The word exposition is related to the word expose. The expository's preacher goal is simply to expose the meaning of the Bible verse by verse. And so that's what we do here. So that's my, um, you know, I was convicted in the very beginning of my ministries that I would open up the word of God and I would allow the word of God to speak. And uh, I didn't want it to make too often uh, we, we can make this an agenda place. That doesn't mean that topical preaching is bad. That's not what I'm saying. Because um, you can be expository even in your topical preaching. But um, too often, you know, topical preaching starts with a topic and then goes and finds verses that fit that topic as opposed to allowing God to speak. And so, you know, 90% maybe 85, nah, probably 90% of the time, we're going to just walk through books of the Bible. And um, we do that so that we can get the full word of God. We do that so that the the full counsel of God will be revealed and that we can learn through that. And what's really cool about that is that we get to talk about things that we would probably not talk about if we were doing topical preaching, right? Things that you might never hear sermons on because of that. But we, we do this because, because God's word says that it was written for us. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, says this. It says, um, I'll get there. How did I not mark it? Eh, I'll just read it. All right, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So in other words, what's there is for us to learn too. So that through the perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So isn't that cool to know? I know sometimes we get into the Old Testament. We've been in the Old Testament for, I don't know, since fall, right? Since October uh, in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus. And we think, man, really, is this for us? You know, this is about a time and a place that was something different than us. We don't, we don't get the way they lived. We don't, we don't have the same kind of understanding. They didn't have what we have. They didn't have iPhones and, and iPads. They didn't, have, they didn't have the scriptures at all. Like, there weren't, you know, I mean, we'll talk in, in um, you know, in uh, uh, Jesus' time. They had scriptures, but they were in scrolls that had to be read usually at the temple. Well, they didn't even have scripture, period. Nothing was written at this point in the book of Exodus. Exodus is written later on as Moses is looking back and he's talking about it all. So um, that was written so that future generations like us could understand what God would talk about. And so the book of Exodus, that's where we are, is the second book of the Holy Scriptures um, it includes the five books, five beginning books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, all written by the prophet Moses. Um, and they're all written with the same theme, and that is talk about the redemption story of God. And really, it was for the people of Israel to understand their identity and who they were in God, um, to understand God's choosing of them and God's purpose of them and God's building of them for a nation ultimately to bring forth the Savior, which is what, you know, for us. And so it's our story as well as their story. And so it's, it's just good to be able to do that. So we're in the midst of that study. So where we are in the book of Exodus, let me give you a little context, is the people of Israel had been in slavery for 430 years. Well, they had been in, in, in Egypt for 430 years, much of that time in slavery, not in the beginning, they went there in victory, and yet as they began to grow, the pharaohs and the and leadership there began to get worried because they were getting so big, and so they began to subjugate them. They began to place them under and, and, and press down so that, so that they would um, kind of always be discouraged, and so that's what they did. 
Um, and, but God saw them, right? God saw who they were. This was God's people. God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that they would own the land of Canaan. And that they would live there, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so God um, sends Moses and brings them out of that by the miraculous hand of God. Like we said uh, last week and the week before, uh, there was not a person who stood on the other side of the Red Sea where God had walked them through on dry land and then defeated those who were chasing them in there. Some of the elite of the Egyptian army there was not a person who stood on those shores who didn't believe that God was real and that God was powerful. And so we're, we're, we're through that. He's done ten plagues. He's done what he's, what he's done, including rescuing them, rescuing them from the hand of Pharaoh through plagues and then through the Red Sea. Um, last week we talked about how they were in the desert. Only three days later, for, you know, three days after the Red Sea, you know, two million people now. And they run out of water. They don't have any water. And so they get to a place where they think there's water, but the water is not suitable to drink. And so they do what you and I would do, which is get serious at that point. You know, and we start kind of blaming and we start complaining and we start wondering and we start like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? And then God miraculously saves them by making that water drinkable. They get on a little bit further on as God takes them away as their canteens are full, but they're running out of food. Uh, you know, I don't know about, I have six in my household. Um, we run through food like it was water. Right? I mean, there's a lot of food going through our home. Um, so you run out quick. And we have freezers to keep it in. We have refrigerators to do that. They had none of that. They're carrying everything on their back. They run out of food. And what do they do? They, instead of responding in faith, trusting that God's going to provide as he always has, they grumble and they complain and they wonder, and what's God going to do and where is he at? And why, where, how, Give us something to eat. Give us something to eat. Even to the point of saying, man, we would have been better off dying in Egypt where we had bread aplenty and meat to fill our bellies. And instead of God answering uh, in judgment and being tired of these people already, he answers in grace and mercy and again provides for them. How good is God? Then we see one more scene last week where uh, there's no water at all to drink, and they need something to drink, and God miraculously provides water from a rock. Moses strikes the rock, a picture of the, of the rock that would be uh, given for us, Jesus. We, we read last week, and uh, water flows forth, and they're taken care of. So God, again, answers with mercy and grace. Isn't it good that God has patience and grace with us? I don't know about you. Oh, yeah, I need it. Right? Thank God that God, thank, thank you, Lord, that you just don't give up on us immediately. He's not like a man. He, would, he doesn't give up like we would give up on people, right? He's patient and tolerant, has grace and mercy. And even when we continue to stumble, continue to fall, continue to falter, God continues to provide, provide grace. That doesn't mean that he's not going to discipline at times. And that doesn't mean that he's not going to bring his judgment. His judgment will come eventually. And, and trust me, you don't want to use up the patience of God. Not a good thing. All right? So that's where we are. They're, they're on the move, if you will. Um, and, and they're in between the Red Sea and Sinai. And, and their journey track is to that place. They want to get to Sinai. That's where God had told Moses to bring them back to at first. That's where God was going to meet with them. That's where he was going to give the law to them. And we'll talk about that in the coming weeks. Um, but they're on their way. And so I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles, to open up to Exodus chapter 17 as we continue on in the study. Um, if you do not have a Bible with you or you can't get it on your phone, uh, there should be a Bible in seats underneath you, two Bibles in every single row. Just reach under, they're, they're actually on the second seat in on every aisle, where they should be, and uh, go ahead and you can open that up. And if you don't have one and you want to keep it, keep that. We want to give it to you. We want you to have that Bible and take it home and use it and enjoy it and read it, hopefully. So in this passage, um, 
there are two kind of strange scenes, and this is what I talked about earlier, where we might not preach these kind of scenes, um, although some of you have heard a little bit of these stories, maybe. Um, but again, they're on route. God's made provision for their every need, right? So he's provided for everything that they need, at least so you would think at this point. What else could they need? Well, here you go. Um, two strange scenes that we're going to look at today, uh, what God does. The first one's a war scene in the middle of the desert. Now, the Egyptians are gone, right? They are no longer a worry for the Israelites at this point. And they won't be a worry for the Israelites for a long time, for a long time coming, right? So if you would, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. It says, then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephimdim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in the book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. From under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Again, strange scene, right? They're on the way. God has provided, He's defeated the Egyptians mightily, handily, uh, and in a way that nobody could ever guess that it was Egypt. Matter of fact, they didn't lift. Any kind of spear or sword or anything in that defeat. All they did was sit back and watch. And God worked. Right? They provided, like we talked about just a moment ago and last week, they provided water when they needed water. He provided food when, he, when they needed food. Miraculous. As a matter of fact, the food that he gave was manna out of heaven. For 40 years, they ate bread that came out of heaven. You know, dew in the morning, they would go and they would collect it, and they would be provided for in that way. Pretty miraculous, right? So they have the hand of God with them in every sense that they go. And every day, uh, if they're willing to look and see, they have the provision of God in their lives completely. The provision of God. And so you think, all right, we're good, man. We've had, we've had the defeat of the Egyptian army, the strongest most powerful nation on the earth to that time that had ever been the Egyptians. God beat them. Food, water, nope, God's taking care of it. And here they are on their way in the middle of the wilderness walking to Mount Sinai. And Amalek comes. Now, when they say Amalek, it's not just one guy. It's the Amalekites. And they're a, a nation of peoples. Um, they are, the Amalekites are descendants from Esau. And they were fierce enemies of Israel. And, and, and it's really an interesting scene, right? He's, Amalek or the Amalekites are, are kind of a nomadic people, and they live in the Negev of Canaan. In other words, the southern regions of Canaan. That's where they live. And so they're not there yet, right? But they've heard about these Israelites. They've heard about the two million people on the move. And just like Egypt... They begin to get worried that maybe they're coming and that they're going to fight against us. And so they kind of begin to take matters in their own hands. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I can just only imagine the war council as they meet. You know, dude, two million people coming, and, and they're going to march right through us. We've got to stop that now. We've got to make sure and, and either scare them or defeat them or do something so that they, don't, they know not to mess with the Amalekites. Like, like we just got to show them who's the boss. And then I can just only imagine, this is, this is Patrick's imagination, okay? Some guy going in the back saying, you know, guys, I heard that in Egypt their God turned the Nile River into blood. 
And, and I heard that, I mean, he, plagues came down and even killed every firstborn of the Egyptians and then defeated the, you know, some of the, you know, stealth men and the warriors of Egy the Egyptians by covering them in the Red Sea. I don't know. Like, maybe that's not a good idea, right? And, and then, I don't know, this is what stupidity and, and, and arrogance and sin does because they're just like, nah, we got them. We can take them. I mean, now the Amalekites are nothing to Egypt, and yet here they go. And, I, and what they do is instead of fighting them head on in a sense where they just wait until they get there and, and garner everybody, they send men there to where they are in the middle of the wilderness. And I don't know if they really meant to defeat them or just scare them to the point, you know, to kill off some of their weak and to kill off some of them, but, but to get them away or something like that. But, but what I know is, is that all of a sudden there's a battle before them, and God is not asking the Israelites just to sit back now. He's asking them to go fight. Now, that's a different posture for Israel. Uh, Israel has never had an army at this point. Israel has never fought a battle at this point. For 430 years, while they've grown into a nation, they have been under the protection of the greatest force and most powerful nation in the world, Egypt. They have not had to fight at all. They've had to build. They're strong. But they are not warriors. As a matter of fact, you remember that they celebrated that God is the warrior for them. And yet here they are in this situation where God says, you need to go out and you need to fight. Like Joshua. So Joshua is the apprentice. You'll see a lot of Joshua in Scripture. Man of God. And God sends them out. You know, Moses sends out Joshua, says, choose a bunch of men, and then you go fight. But I'm going to be here supporting you. Like, what do you mean? Right? So Moses, they go out and fight. They do what they're told to do. Moses goes up on a mountain that can overlook the valley, and he takes the staff of God in his hands. Now, some of you, some of you older Christians, if you've been in Sunday school, you've probably heard this story. You've probably heard the story of Moses where he lifts his arms up you know, with the staff of God in his hand, and when, and when they do that, they win, and when he lowers it, they get defeated, and so Aaron and her, right, these two men come, and they support him, and, and, and as one pastor I, I, I read, he said, when I always heard about it, uh, you know, when I always taught it, you know, learned it in Sunday school and all those kind of things, when I first learned about it, it was about, you know, you need to be a praying people, and you need to continue to lift your hands in prayer to God, and you need others around you who will support that and lift that, and, and, and you need other people who can, who can support you in prayer, and you need to keep before God and keep praying and keep giving it before Jesus. And he said, you know, while all of that is correct, you do need to pray, you do need to continue to come before God. You do need others who will be around you, who will support you and lift you up and do that. But it's no place in this scripture. You're not going to get that from here. Because that's not what he's talking about. Matter of fact, the staff of God, the staff of Moses, God always used as, a, as an instrument to perform the plagues of judgment against Egypt. It marked the power of God against those who would stand against the people of God. And so as Moses raises the staff in his hands, it is the judgment of God reigning through the people of Israel now, not just in spite of the people of Israel. It's God bringing the judgment on the Amalekites because the Amalekites have stood against God and against God's people. You remember way back in the beginning of Exodus, when Moses first went to Pharaoh, and Moses said, you know, you need to let my people go worship the Lord. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is the Lord? And then God answers that question with plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. And almost on every one, as he's delivering the message of the plague that he would say in that, that you might know that the Lord is God. That you might know that the Lord is God. Until the end, and then at the end of it, he begins to change that, not only that you might know that the Lord is God, the Egyptians, but that the nations may know 
that Yahweh is God, that he is the great I am. And so that is what's happening is God begins to show himself even to the nations um, of God. And, and often, as is true, um, there has been two responses to God. And I'm going to tell you, any time that the Holy Spirit goes out, so whenever Scripture goes out, the Holy Spirit goes out, whenever there's conviction of God, two things happen. Either you are drawn in or you are repelled away. There are people who hear about God, think about God, want, you know, hear the God's word, hear something about God, and they begin to be intrigued and they begin to draw in and they begin to want to know more. And then there are those who hear about God, who see the things of God, who, who whatever, you know, invited to God, and they go, no, 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 it can't be that. And they push away. And both of those are responses to God that always happen. Either you walk a little bit away or you walk a little bit towards. And what we see here is the Amalekites, in response to the power of God that they have heard about in this world, are not drawing near God. They are pushing away. So much so that they fight against the people of God and they fight against God's nation instead of giving honor that is due because obviously God is here and God is with them. They push away. And they want to attack and they want to fight. So God brings judgment. Just like he brought judgment on Egypt who would not do as God obeyed and would not honor God, Yahweh, as the only God. There aren't a lot of gods. There aren't a lot of things. He's the only God. And so they, they, they stand against God and God judges them to the point where he says one day the Amalekites will be gone from the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, it's interesting because a lot of people read the Old Testament and they think that there's a different God than the New Testament. Yeah, because you see a lot of blood, and you see a lot of, a, a lot of judgment at times on different nations. Um, and that judgment is never because, well, I just don't like you and you're not my nation. As a matter of fact, we see God working in his hand, giving grace to other nations if they will repent and honor God as God. But they will refuse to do so, and so God will bring judgment on them. And the Amalekites will be judged, as a matter of fact. Later on in life, with the first king, Saul is commanded to wipe out the Amalekites in a battle, and he refuses to do so. He refuses to wipe out everything that they have. And it's not about God's hatred or that God's, you know, God's a God of war. God's a, a warrior always. God is a warrior. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And that's a good thing if you're on his side, right? Because he fights for you, and he's the one that you can trust in to take care of it. But if you are against God, that's a bad thing, because what that means is that you will lose. Don't take, like we just said, don't take his patience as license to think that you're okay. It is only God's grace that he's giving you more time. Scripture says, later on, Hebrews, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the angry God, an angry God. And make no mistake about it, God is angry at sin. That's what it tells us in Romans chapter 1. God is a warrior, and he will bring his judgment. And so God fights in this battle, but again, unlike what he's done in the past, where you just sit back and I provide, now you have to go out. And that is often how God works, isn't it? He's like, man, that's something ahead of you. Now you go in there and get them. And we think, oh, look, see, i got to have my own strength. No, no, no. God says, you go in and I'll give the strength. You go in and I'll, I'll be your strength. I'll be your source. Just like what Michelle said earlier, right? The goodness of God who gives us strength when we, when we lack. And by the way, you always lack. Matter of fact, we get into trouble when we think that I don't need God, that I'm okay on my own, that I have enough strength. You do not. A lot of people say that, you know, religion, Jesus, it's a crutch. Um, you betcha. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are healthy, I came to those who are sick. Oh, so there's people who are healthy? No, no, no. You're all sick, but unless you realize you're sick, I can't help you. you got to understand your need. And so 
I love this scene because God again shows up, but he shows up in a way where he says, you need to go out there, but it's going to be evident that it, your strength is not enough. Because when the staff of God is not raised, you know, when he gets tired and he lowers it, the Amalekites begin to win the battle. When it's raised again, the Israelites win the battle. Did the Israelites win the battle? Yes, but they didn't win the battle on their own, and they wouldn't have won without God. They wouldn't have won. Um, interesting scene, right? Interesting war scene where God says it. Well, we have another scene in Scripture. It's a wisdom scene, um, and it's chapter 18. So uh, hang with me. I'm going to read it because I want you to get the fullness of it. So again, so they've wandered on. They're kind of near the mountain of God at this point, right? Not on the mountain. No one's on the mountain. And so, you know, to say they're at the mountain of God is like to say, like, you know, I live in a town 50 miles from the mountain or 20 miles or 10 miles or something like that where the mountain's there, but I'm outside of it. You know what I mean? So listen to what it says, verse 1, chapter 18. Then Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, of his, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife Zipporah after he had sent her away, and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The other was named Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help, the deliverer who delivered and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he camped at the Mount of God. And he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and, your two, and her two sons with her. Then Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they each asked, they asked each other of their welfare and went to the tent. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done for, to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how God had delivered them, how the Lord had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness of the Lord had done in Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Um, interesting scene. So Jethro comes. So uh, as you might remember, Moses' wife and two sons had gone with him when he first began to journey to Egypt. But at some point, Moses is like, this is getting serious. I'm sending my family back. Right? Not a bad plan. Okay? So he sends his family back, and, and now he's out there, and his father-in-law hears, and he's heard of all that has happened. You know, in other words, what does that mean? That means that news has traveled, right? The Amalekites had heard about it because it had traveled all around. Matter of fact, even 40 years later, when they enter the land of Canaan in Jericho, they'd heard about it, about what had gone on. So, so they're there. And Jethro comes and he meets him and he, and he hears about it and they talk and Moses tells him everything. And some people kind of allude that maybe this is Jethro's salvation. You understand, listen, Jethro was a priest in Midian. He was priest probably and believed in other gods. He worshipped other gods. He would sacrifice to other gods. Um, and here he comes and he sees uh, Moses and he hears of all he does. And, and, and I, I would say I'm just unsure of his salvation at that point. Uh, it doesn't matter. God knows. Praise the Lord, right? But, um, you know, his, his answer is, well, now I see that God is a God above all gods. You know, he's the most powerful God. But God's not the chief God. He's the only God. Right? We get that? He's not the chief God above, among many gods. He's the only God. And he begins to bless the Lord for what he's done. And, and people come and they, um, they celebrate with him. Verse 13. It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood about Moses from morning till evening. 
When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning till evening? Moses said, because, Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his law. So what happens is, is that Moses is, is dealing with the people. So, you know, you realize they're not walking the whole time, right? You get that? So they're, they're, they get to a place and they camp out. And um, there are two million people. And where there are people, there are problems. I don't care whether you have 2 million, 200, or 20. Where there are people, there are problems. And, and what they understand at this point is that God has spoken to Moses. And Moses, and, and this is true, at this point in history, Moses is the man who understands more about God than anybody else. He's seen God mood. He's seen God power. I mean, I, I know Abraham talked with God. Moses has talked with God. But, but he has seen God move in miraculous ways, right? So he's understanding more and more about this God of, of his fathers. And, and he's the man who understands that. So they come to him. So they come to him for judgment and they come for him for understanding, to understand God's law and to understand what God would want in this situation. Right? Why? Because there's two Million people. Oy vey. Oof. Can you imagine? Like you're in charge of two mil. I'd be like, God, can you send somebody else, please? Right? So that's what he's doing, and that's because that's, that's what he knows. And they keep coming to him, and they keep coming to him for counsel. But, but Jethro has some words for him, words that are wise words. Listen to what he says, verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Listen to me. I give you counsel. I will give you, I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God, and you bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which that you walk and the work that you are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, and I love this, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and shall place them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times and let them let every major dispute they will... They, I'm sorry. And let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. They judged the people at all times, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they, would they themselves would judge. Then Moses bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went his way to his own land. Now, I got to tell you, I love Scripture. I love Scripture. And if you want to know and learn about leadership, there's some great books out there, but you can go to Scripture, and you can find the principal Scripture, and this is one of them. So Moses was dealing with everything himself, right? Why? Because, well, they need to know, and they need somebody who will. And Jethro's father, I love it. He says, this thing that you are doing is not good. You're going to wear out. The people are going to wear out. It's not going to be a lasting thing. In other words, it, it can't endure. What you've done is, is you've set up a system, Moses, that, that can't continue. Like, like it, it, just, it just won't work. But that's the way we get, don't we? Like when we want something done and we want it done right, what do we do? Well, we do it. Well, train other people to do it. What's the problem with other people doing things that are, are vital and that you know how to do? They don't do it the same way. They don't always do it the right way. They mess up. And so you're like, fine, that's all right. Get away. I'll just do it myself. It's the temptation of every leader. 
to take on every problem and to take on everything. We, we call that micromanagement at times. It's not always micromanagement. And I'm going to tell you, micromanagement is not always bad. There are times that micromanagement is needed. In other words, you need to get in there as the boss, and you need to work it out and run it out and make it work. But if you're going to do that on everything, you're going to wear yourself out, and you're going to wear your people out. And that's what he tells Moses. And so I love what he says. You notice he doesn't just say choose men. He says teach them first the statutes of God. They don't know the things of God that you do, so you need to teach them to know the things of God that you do. And you need to teach them well so that they'll understand and so that they can grow up so that they can be men of wisdom and men of grace and men who have understanding of God. Not practical answers, but godly answers. Too often, we're just pragmatic about everything where we're just looking for the right answers or the right thing at the right time instead of the godly answers that we so desperately need. So again, it's not about micromanagement necessarily. It's about delegation so that you can endure in ministry. Otherwise, you'll burn out. How many, I, listen, I've known way too many pastors who have burned out. I know way too many employees who have burned out. Um, praise the Lord, I've never burned out. I've come close. I've been singed, if you will, as many of you have at different times. And it's a great reminder that we desperately need wisdom from other sources, even for the fact that you have this man who comes in, who I'm not sure is a believer, you know, a, a full believer in God, if I can say that, as God being the only God. I, I, don't, I don't know his heart. God knows his heart, right? Uh, I, I pray that when I get to heaven, Jethro's there too. Um, but what I do know is that th there's a man who comes from the outside who's not been in the situation, who has eyes that are fresh and eyes that can give a little wisdom. And he is a man of wisdom, right? He's an older man. He's a, uh, he's a man that Moses will listen to. And so God sends a man that Moses will listen to so that Moses will listen to him. So too many problems with leaders is that they're unwilling to listen and they're unwilling to learn. And if you are unwilling to listen and you are unwilling to learn, then you will fail ultimately. Even if it's your, your, your company or your thing is wildly successful, but it doesn't endure because somebody can't sustain what you are. If it's all wrapped around you, it will not last. It will not endure. And the reality is, is that you can't do it alone. Teams are good. Doesn't mean there's not a leader. As a matter of fact, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in teams, and I'm also a firm believer that every team needs a leader. A leader. If you, have a, if you just have a bunch of leaders going in different directions, you're, you're going to fight. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't need a group of leaders. That's not what I'm saying. But, but one has to lead that group. Otherwise, then you start going off in different splitting directions all the time, and, and you're not focused way too often. So what does good leadership do? Good leadership equips others for ministry. Good leaders, good leadership in Israel was not that Moses handled everything himself. It's that he taught the people the statutes and the God. And then he chose men who were men um, who weren't just anybody out there. As a matter of fact, I love what it says. Go back to verse 22. Um, I'm sorry, verse 21. He says, select able body, able men who fear God, men of truth, Men and those who hate dishonest gain. In other words, they're not going to be bribed. You, you know, it's interesting. Um, two qualities of biblical um, New Testament leaders right there in Ephesians chapter 3. Hmm. Why? Because maybe God's uh, system is always, right? Maybe, maybe what God does is always, it's not Ephesians chapter 3, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, but because God's leadership and God's perspective on leaders is always the same. It's not just anybody. It's men who have proven themselves, men who can not look at their own personal interests but look out for God's interests, right? So, um, you know, we have elders in our church who lead our church, and I'm the leader of the elder board in that sense as I lead, but, but I am not a man on my own. Desperately do we need wise counsel together. 
Because otherwise, you, you start getting off and you start, you, you just have bad, you need perspective if anything else. You need perspective. And, um, you know, the definition, I, I tell this to a lot of people, the definition, by definition, I'm sorry, by definition, a blind spot is something you can't see. So what does that mean? I need somebody else to see it for me. Which means that you need men who are not looking to please somebody, but men who are looking to please God and who are willing to say anything to each other. Praise God we have those kind of elders in our church. Praise God that we have men and women who are deacons, who are men and women of, 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 who, who are not subject to, to, to dishonest gain, who are men and women who desire the truth, and when, men and women who desire to see God move. And God's purpose is done. You can't do it alone. Let me, let me hit, you cannot do it alone. God never meant for you to do it alone. As a matter of fact, if you're doing it alone, it's for one of two reasons. It's either because you're in a brand new situation where you got to do it alone and you're gathering a team around you to build. Or you're that person who's always out there. And, and as someone once said, if you're... If you're in front of everybody and nobody's following, you're not a leader. You're just somebody going on a long walk. And too many people are just going on a long walk. Um, you know why it's easier just to be demanding? Matter of fact, you know what's hard about leading a church? Is that it's full of volunteers. I, honestly. And, and it's full of people who can walk out the door. Anytime they want to. Right? It's easier to lead Troy. It's not as easy to lead Janice. She doesn't really need the job. <laughs> um, Troy needs the job. You know what I mean? So, like, he's just not opening and quitting and going someplace. And now he has a wife, and I'd love to see him try that just for the fun of it to see what would happen on her face. And she takes out the frying. You have a frying pan, right, at home? Just duck, Troy, duck, okay? No, right? I mean, it's put it, but it is. I mean, I'm Troy's boss. When I say something to Troy, when I ask Janet to do something, they do it. They, now, now, listen, I, I hope I've built a team, and they will give me counsel, and I'm constantly asking them because they're the ones who are right there. Constantly asking them, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? Um, but, but they do what I think, <laughs> ultimately. And, and you and 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 you guys don't always. I try, you know, but it's hard, right? Because because it's volunteers. So, but but the reality is 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 that we're not just meant to command people. See, this is not my church. As a matter of fact, a few years ago we replaced a sign out front, and I remember when the deacons came and they said, "Do you want your name out there?" Because our the, the pastor's name used to be on the sign, and I said, "Absolutely not." Because this is not my church. No, it is my church. I'm a part of this church, and I do lead this church, right? But this is our church. This is our church. You are as responsible for this church as I am, even though I get paid. You are committed. I hope many, and that's what I love about you guys, is that you are committed to our body, right? So that when you do get offended, you just don't walk out the door. Because that's what the world, yeah, there's always another church, and there's another church out there. And although there aren't tons and tons of great churches out there, there are plenty of good churches out there to go to. But God's called us here, right? And we're a team. Matter of fact, we're God's team. But even more than that, the biblical illustration is that we're not a team, but we're a family. And I need you as much as you need me. Because we wouldn't be complete without each other. Right? So I don't have every answer. So guess what? Stop calling. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> go to Rich. He's right there. Bob, he's back there. Peter, somewhere. Listen, Deacon, they're all good. And they are. Listen, I, I love it when you guys go to them for counsel. And you do. Praise the Lord. And, and they are wise men who give wise, godly counsel. But they're not the pastor. Actually, biblically, they are. They're the unpaid pastors of our church. As, as a, a, an elder once said to me, right, I'm paid to be good. They're good for nothing. 
sorry. <clears throat> An elder said that to me one day. <laughs> Wasn't in this church. Anyway, um, you know what's happening here? God is setting up Israel to be self-governed. Israel has never governed their self. They've had elders in Israel, all right, different than what elders in the church are, but they've had elders in Israel that would lead the tribes and those kind of things, but they've never fully self-governed themselves. And God is setting them up to be fully self-governing because he has built indeed a nation. Because at Sinai, and we're going to get into it next week, they're going to get the law of God. They're going to get these statutes and how to be a people and how to be a nation. And so I love this because once again, God's protecting and caring for his people. Right? And I love this because, again, this isn't the thrilling stuff. This isn't the march through the Red Sea. This isn't the waves crashing and God, you know, striking the rock and water flowing out of it. This is like, all right, there's war, but now they got to fight, but God's protecting them. And then there's wisdom where God's just setting them up. But, oh, my goodness, what we can learn from the Word of God for life. For life. The wisdom of God. As a matter of fact, you know, in James chapter 1, verse 5, God says, if anyone lacks wisdom, just ask, and God will give it freely. And you know who needs wisdom? All of us. I, I, I pray it often when I'm going into counsel, sometimes with them. God, I, I, I'm not wise enough. We need you. Because if you don't show up, who, who knows what's going to happen. So, all right? God is good, Amen. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father God, I, I do thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, uh, for the complete and full word of God. Lord, um, might not be always something that we would choose to preach, but boy, what greatness there is in that, Lord. What, what greatness there is to see that you are God and that, Lord, you won't always, as we sit back, but, you know, just show up, but you're going to show up in and through as we walk and as we, um, as we obey you. Where God sends, God provides. Always. Always. You know, Lord, I, I um, that, the ma that the nations might know. Lord, may you open up our eyes to see you. First, may we open up our eyes to see your need for you fact that we need your grace and we need your mercy because we are sinners and in desperate need of a, of a loving, glorious God. But Lord, also let us open our eyes every day to your provision. Let us open our eyes every day that we would trust you even when the battle is before us. Even when we've never had to do anything, but now you're calling us to do something. And Father, may we do it together. May we do it as a as a family of God together, may we go forth in battle. May we go forth in prayer. May we go forth just dealing with our disputes together. Because we're people. And all of that, Lord, we desperately need you. Desperately need your grace, your mercy. We need your love. We need your spirit. And we need each other. Father, I thank you for the church of God. I thank you for Grace Gospel Church. Grow us to be your people, to go your way, to accomplish your purposes, to exalt Christ and to point others to you. God, I love you. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name.